On Friday, January 13th, yes, Friday the 13th, Sazerac, the parent company of Buffalo Trace and 1792, filed a 13-page lawsuit against RNDC, its former distributor. If you want to know what it says and what it might mean, then stick around. So first off, whenever I do these bonus pieces, unfortunately I don't have Wes with all of his amazing equipment here to help me. So if the sound is a little bit off or the video is not as good as normal, I apologize for that. Uh, so what had happened was I released a, a Will Pappy Van Winkle be back on shelves after Buffalo Trace Fires Distributor, which was episode 186. And then as a follow-up piece to clarify some of the points in the original piece, I released Buffalo Trace Fires National Distributor Part 2, Shocking New Developments. Uh, now, Sazerac has filed this lawsuit, and many of you have asked me to comment on it. So before we get too into it, I want to thank all of our new Patreon members and let you know out there as a viewer that producing this type of content can be very expensive, and it is very thoughtful if you enjoy it to get involved and join Patreon and support the cause. We have a lot of big plans for the future, building community through whiskey, suicide prevention awareness, mental health awareness. If you want to get involved in that type of thing, I invite you to go over to patreon.com and join Bourbon Real Talk Plus today. Now, on to disclaimers. So, all of this information came uh, regarding the contents of the lawsuit from an article that was published in Wine and Spirits Daily. Uh, and most of what I'm going to say when I talk about Sazerac's position are copied and pasted out of the lawsuit. Uh, since the release of the first two pieces, I've spoke with over a dozen current and former RNDC employees who wanted to give me their perspective so that I would have the full story. And all of my sources asked to remain anonymous. Uh, so once I start talking about RNDC's position, this does come directly from the horse's mouth, if you will. And it's not my intention to paint either party in a good or bad light, uh, but I'm trying to interpret what is going on, what both sides are saying, to help you, the consumer, understand what's likely to happen as a result of all of this and the impact on the future. So let's get into what the lawsuit actually says. Uh, and this is all from Sazerac's perspective. So Sazerac says that over the past several years, RNDC's performance as a distributor grew worse and worse. Sazerac attempted to work with RNDC to come up with ways to improve its performance. Uh, since the termination, which happened on uh, December the 30th, uh, 2022, RNDC has badmouthed Sazerac in the marketplace, ceased cooperation with Sazerac, and otherwise attempted to harm Sazerac by unfairly disrupting future sales and the transition to new distributors. Sazerac claims that in recent years, RNDC refused to invest in its sales force or to provide sufficient incentives to its employees to promote Sazerac products. Sazerac claims that in recent years, they had asked RNDC to condition the purchase of its allocated items on the sale of non-allocated Sazerac items, but that RNDC was using those items to sell non-Sazerac products which is something that I mentioned in my original video. I got pushback and we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, Sazerac claims that it was forced to invest $100 million creating its own dedicated field marketing teams to achieve what RNDC failed to do. Sazerac claims that in September of 2021, both parties, both Sazerac and RNDC, negotiated a new global distribution agreement where RNDC would reportedly take a flat dollar fee for each case to offset the cost of dedicated field marketing teams. So we talked about this in the last video. Uh, with normal margins on a $60 bottle, RNDC would make about $15.25 per bottle. Uh, they were asked to take between a dollar and a dollar twenty-five per bottle. And the, the logic was, well, we had to hire all of these field marketing teams, and so we, we need a discount in our costs. But ironically, in the lawsuit, it also says that RNDC in this new global marketing agreement was required to provide funds to Sazerac to help fund their field sales force. 
And so there are agreements between the wholesale tier and the producer tier where the um, wholesale tier has some financial obligations to pay back to the producer for certain, for certain you know, sales and marketing efforts. Um, so I don't know if they're saying that RNDC was re required to pay back by reducing the fee that they normally charge for their distribution services, or if they actually were supposed to like get invoiced and cut a check back to Sazerac, which would be pretty interesting considering they had just taken a major cut in compensation. And if they were also required to take what little they were receiving and pay that back to Sazerac for the right to distribute the product, that would be a pretty onerous agreement. Uh, this agreement also includes bonuses for RNDC to achieve sales quotas. And that's important because Sazerac's argument is that they hadn't treated RNDC unfairly. Yes, they did take over part of the sales job that RNDC was previously responsible for. They did ask for a discount, um, but they gave them the sales quotas that if you continue to work hard and you hit the quotas, you'd still be able to get substantial compensation for your role that you're playing in the distribution process. Um, in June of 2022, RNDC sent Sazerac a letter terminating the agreement effective 60 days from the date of the letter. So that is the global marketing agreement in June. Uh, so it started in uh, September, but in June, RNDC said, we're not abiding by this contract that we signed any longer, and at 60 days it ends. So RNDC did terminate that sometime around August, and they operated the two companies without an agreement between that termination and December 30th, when Sazerac announced that it was terminating their relationship with RNDC effective February 1st, 2023. Sazerac claims that on January the 3rd, RNDC quote unquote, began to act contrary to any reasonable transition by raising prices and canceling planned promotions and discounts. Sazerac claims that RNDC stopped payment on approximately $38.6 million of wholesale liquor products. And RNDC claimed a unilateral right to offset payments to Sazerac with disputed amounts effectively holding the receivables hostage to demand reconciliation payments. So basically what that means is, as I mentioned, in the relationship between the producer and the wholesaler, the wholesaler sometimes has the right to bill back the producer for certain sales promotions and things that they did. For instance, they can offer a per case bonus on Fireball to get more Fireball sold during a sales season. And they can say, hey, sales reps, you're gonna get a $10 bonus for a case of Fireball that you sell. And sometimes they'll split that. And, and, and Sazerac says, when all is said and done, bill us for half of the bonuses that you paid out. And we'll pay $5 per case. You pay $5 per case. And there's lots of things like that uh, having to do with you know promotional setups and th things that you do in stores. Uh, there's a lot of it. So let's talk about what RNDC side is. So RNDC says that over the past few years, Sazerac has been taking control over many aspects of the role that RNDC was supposed to play as wholesaler. And that's where all of these new um, um, marketing team reps come into play. Uh, they were the ones that were going into the stores. They were the ones that were negotiating purchases of non-allocated products and awarding allocated products as a result of the store doing what it was that the Sazerac rep wanted to do, things like that. RNDC uh, claims that they've not per failed to perform and that it hasn't even been in control of its own business decisions for the last few years to even be judged on the outcome because they were forced to do things Sazerac's way. And so RNDC is like, you're talking about all these you know, missed performance objectives, but we didn't even have the right to do what we believed was right as a company to help you grow your brands because you had seized all of the control. Uh, RNDC claims that the problems were manufactured by Sazerac by unilaterally setting performance objectives that Sazerac knew were not possible to meet. And RNDC would not have agreed except for they had no choice because Sazerac represented such a large portion of their portfolio. And so RNDC is basically saying all of these failed performance objectives are all manufactured on the Sazerac side. They did it on purpose. They gave us goals without consulting us 
We didn't have a chance to tell them that we didn't think it was possible. We didn't have a chance to tell them that the way that they're going about it is the wrong way. We would be doing it differently. Yet we were held accountable for the outcome of the decisions that were made by Sazerac, according to RNDC. RNDC claims that its employees have lost substantial portion of their income with this change and they are behaving reasonably given the change. They're, they're working to deplete inventory because in some states, Sazerac um, products are still able to be sold by RNDC uh, to the existing accounts. In some states, they can't. Um, so, so RNDC says like, hey, we're trying to get rid of this inventory. We want to get our money out of it. Um, but the employees have no incentive to continue to push Sazerac products to run special promotions and all that stuff because they know that in a couple of months, the whole relationship's going to be severed. RDC claims that Sazerac simultaneously asked them to work for substantially less, mo less money while also complaining about the lack of investment by RDC to meet sales objectives RDC didn't agree to and a contract that required them to pay for Sazerac for the sales staff that they had hired against RDC's will. RDC claims that it is being forced in some states to sell existing inventory to the new wholesaler. And there are disputes over what we call laid in costs. So whenever a wholesaler buys inventory from a producer, there's fees to get the inventory to the, the wholesaler's warehouse. There's also fees that you pay to the state called excise tax, uh, which are different in every state. And those are what we call laid in cost. Um, and so they're asking that their laid-in costs be added into the wholesale purchase price to sell from one wholesaler to the other. And there's also a dispute about whether or not RNDC is going to be paid any profits above their original ac acquisition costs. That they're not being unreasonable and they're not trying to, you know, disrupt the transition to the new wholesaler. But as a business, it doesn't make sense for them to sell the inventory at the same price that they paid for it. They're asking for some profits and they feel like that's reasonable. Uh, RNDC claims that, yes, there were instances where rogue employees uh, did use Sazerac products to promote non-Sazerac brands, but this was the exception rather than the rule, and that these instances were always dealt with very harshly, and it, in, it was in no way widespread enough to justify terminating the relationship the way that Sazerac did. RNDC claims that Sazerac was not forced to invest in its own sales staff. It was always the plan because ultimately... Sazerac has a plan to start to work around the three-tier system, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the conclusion section. RNDC claims that the global agreement uh, with Sazerac for the per case fee was forced upon them, and um, the possibility of RNDC even being able to perform under those agreements was impossible, and that was by design to create a rupture and a separation. RNDC claims that there are many things that producers agree to pay the wholesaler for, and there are countless outstanding payments due to RNDC from Sazerac Corporation, and until they are calculated, and are, they're not going to make final payment for the Sazerac invoices, and then have to chase Sazerac around to get payment for the things that they're owed, and that it is justifiable to hold off on paying final invoices until that reconciliation is done. So... What does all this mean uh, to you as a consumer? And all of this section is my personal opinion. So one thing to keep in mind about this rupture is that Sazerac's owner, Bill Goldring's grandfather was one of the original founders of what is now RNDC. So through you know, various mergers and acquisitions over the decades, these two companies have a long tangled path. And I can't help but think that some of that history plays in to how both sides are viewing each other in this conflict. I think that sometime in the last few years, Sazerac did feel that they were getting the raw end of the deal in the relationship with RNDC. And based on my conversations that I've had with retail stores that have dealt with RNDC on Sazerac products, it's not hard to figure out why Sazerac might have felt that way uh, because retailers were very upset with the way that RNDC was handling things. Um, as we mentioned, RNDC claims that they lost control to do those types of things several years ago and that Sazerac is just crying over spilled milk now because all of that had been corrected. It looks like to me that in the wake of Sazerac coming to the conclusion that RNDC wasn't handling things the way that they wanted, that they started to seize control over critical elements of the distribution process and that they started to give RNDC performance objectives that were very aggressive. And at some point, it seems to me, that Sazerac did decide 
that they wanted to manage RNDC out of the process. RNDC knew that Sazerac was a huge part of their business and felt that they had to comply with Sazerac and try and salvage the relationship, but ended up in a relationship that was not sustainable. It's unclear whether or not Sazerac started off this process with the intention of firing RNDC and making all of these claims and making it impossible so that they had a right to back out of that relationship as RNDC claims, you know, that's how they say it went down. Or if Sazerac really did feel forced to make moves because they perceived that RNDC was failing. Um, I'm not sure exactly when that transition happened, but what I do know is that it's clear that this change is going to happen and it's going to have some ripple effects in the industry and therefore for consumers. So one of the things that I find most fascinating about this is Sazerac's move is significant because it's the first major producer to attempt to work around the three-tier system laws. And this is significant because of what they call Tidehouse laws. And according to the definition in the regulations, Tidehouse means any overlapping ownership or other prohibited relationship between those engaged in the alcohol beverage industry at different levels, that is, between a manufacturer and a wholesaler or retailer, or between a wholesaler and a retailer. And so there are laws on the books that make it in some states so that you can have an in-market brand rep if you're Sazerac, but that person's not allowed to move any bottles around the retail store uh, because that violates the separation of the tiers. That person might be able to negotiate with you that you're gonna put up a display, uh, but they're not allowed to deliver this play, or if they are, they're not allowed to put it together for the retail store. And so there's a lot of, of nuance in there that just because Sazerac wants to hire sales reps to do what RNDC's reps used to do, it may not be allowed in the various states. And that's why I say this, this is significant because this may open up an entire conversation about whether or not we need to rehaul three-tier system laws and up until this point, Sazerac being the second largest spirits producer in the United States, there hasn't been any large enough players that have shown any interest in dismantling the three-tier system for us to even have any expectation that that was going to be on the table. And that's what I think is most significant about this. Um, RNDC representatives have told me that Sazerac is being investigated in several states uh, for their new business model because it may not be allowed in that state. Um, I haven't independently confirmed that, but uh, I have heard that from a couple of different sources. I will also say that this lawsuit, and, and this is just my opinion, is political posturing on the part of Sazerac and was an opportunity to try and control the narrative in the public space. Um, why else are they talking about past failures regarding a vendor that they've already terminated the relationship with in a lawsuit that was essentially about collection of, of invoices that were outstanding. There's no reason to even talk about their failures. All they have to do is talk about the legal aspects of whether or not the money was owed, when it was due, and whether or not it's been paid. And that's what makes me think this may have been more political posturing on their part. I, I think what's gonna happen, there's gonna be a final accounting that's done. Um, and when two behemoth companies like this part ways, you know, somebody's going to have to figure out, you know, the dollars and cents on both sides. I think there's going to be a reconciliation. And at that point, RNDC will pay. Um, there's probably going to be a lot of lawsuits uh, disputing the various amounts that RNDC claims versus Sazerac and all that stuff. But it'll all get worked out. So um, and, and another thing that I'd love to point out in this is that Sazerac is a billion dollar a year company. So the outstanding balance of thirty eight point six million represents less than four percent of their total volume on an annual basis. Um, so while the number seems pretty huge, the amount in dispute is actually relatively small. If this is your first time watching the show, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our philosophy. At Bourbon Real Talk, we are all about bringing people together around bourbon. And connection and community is something that's personally important to me because I did lose my brother to suicide in 2014. And in the aftermath of that, I was trying to find ways to get people connected and involved in a community so that they wouldn't feel alone and that there would be a reminder there that was constant that they were needed and people wanted them around. So they didn't feel the way that my brother did when he took his life. 
And I started to notice the connective power of bourbon. And so part of the reason why I started the podcast was so that I could get you connected to whiskey so that whiskey could do the rest of the job and get you connected to others. But in that process, I did come across the you know dirty underbelly of online social communities, and that's the trolls. And I saw a lot of people being hateful to strangers online. And that made me want to start Bourbon Real Talk Community, which is a free Facebook-based whiskey forum and there are no trolls there you can go you can discuss you can talk about any brand that you like and no one's going to make fun of you you can ask questions um, because i knew that we needed a forum that wasn't filled with that hate Um, but seeing that hate also made me realize that if someone can hate you online that doesn't know you there's nothing that keeps me from loving you online even though i don't really know you and that's why i end every podcast the same way and that's this if you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. Lucy. Hey, I can't have you snoring, sweet girl. I love you, but you can't snore.